Kahala. Welcome to Where's Wilmington, another segment where we're talking about what's going on in your town and beyond. And today I have with me my guest, who is John Bonomo. Nice to see you. My pleasure to be here. He is from the Family and Trial Court of Middlesex County. Yes. He's the registrar there, actually the registrar there, I should say. Used to be registrar in the old days when I went to college, but now it's mm. registrar. It's actually registrar. So tell me a little bit about what that really means to the folks watching sure, this program. Sure. The Middlesex County and Family Court Register Probate is responsible for overseeing the court in the trial court system that handles all family matters. If you think of uh, a probate, most people just think of wills. Right. But the probate court is much more extensive than that. The probate court takes into consideration uh, matters of adoption, child support, child custody, paternity ship. It takes into account guardianship. It takes into account divorces, contested so you or uncontested. A lot of soup in that bowl. We also there's do. a lot of things. Right, um, it does. Adoptions, change a name. We also take into account wills when people pass away. Right. We also take into account people who die in testate, which means no will or no trust. So it's quite an extensive. Now, I also want to add, we also take in restraining orders if people okay. are trying to seek a restraining order in their home. Uh, against someone that may harm them or their children, we take that into account. So, uh, so all of the uh, matters I just outlined are handled by the Middlesex County Probate and Family Court, which is m located in Cambridge Excellent. as our main office. But we have satellite sessions in Lowell, mm -hmm. in Concord, and in Marlborough. But you're a local boy. I you am. have family from around this area. I am. Actually, uh, I grew up in Somerville. Um, and there's many people who live here in Wilmington from Somerville. My Aunt Annette and my Uncle Jackie are here right. uh, in Somerville by Silver Lake. Um, my parents only live right over the line on 129 in Villa Recker. I have a sister who is uh, living in uh, Tewksbury. I had a brother who just moved from Wicks st mm. Street to um, North Carolina. So, so your heart is really in yeah. this community. Yeah, very much so. Tell me how you became a register. And I know a little bit of background involves psychology, which I think mm -hmm. might be very helpful right. in dealing with these kinds of matters. Well, prior to being the register of the probate and family court, um, I served in local politics. I served six years on the Somerville School Committee, and I served 12 years on the Board of Aldermen, which is similar to the Board of Selectmen. Um, and that was my political activity. Uh, Education-wise, I have a master's degree from Northeastern University uh, School of Public Administration. Uh, and then my day jobs were interesting because back in, starting in 1980, I became the director of a city human service agency. Yeah. I went on to work in county government where I served as the uh, county administrator from 1988 to 1991. And then when I left county government, I went on to state government and I served as the director of the um, uh, what is formerly known as ET Choices is mm -hmm. called the Mass Jobs Program for the Department of Transitional Assistance. And then after that, uh, I became the director of the One Stop Career Center Initiative, which is a state and federal initiative to bring employers and employees together. So how do you feel all of that scope helped you to do what you're doing now? Good question. Um, as uh, the register of the Probate and Family Court, it really requires me to, to balance, to use political skills and statesmanship skills and working with legislators like your very good legislator here, Jim Maselli, mm -hmm. who's been very supportive of us in Wilmington. It's allowed me to know how the government process works vis-a-vis -vis funding through the state legislature, um, handling of fees, uh, et cetera. On the other hand, it's given me the administrative skills to be an administrator by day, to supervise a staff of over 80 people, to handle constituent services, and we, we had 25,000 new filings last year. Wow. So if you take the political skills, the administrative skills, and the educational skills, and you bring them all together, I th it, it puts me in a position to have a good balance. Which is excellent. Do you feel that this particular job should be an elected position, or is it something you feel someone should be able to keep yeah. the time indefinitely? Well, I'm elected. I'm elected every six years. Um, I was elected first in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And in that election, it was interesting because it was a special election to fill a vacant position, an unencumbered, an, un, uh, uh, an encumbered was not completed, this term was removed, and I ran for a special election with eight people running. There was a candidate from Wilmington. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, from Bill Areca. And um, when I ran, it was only for the two years. Right. And in, in that race, eight of us ran, and I lost the primary by 30 
two votes. I held a recount. And I won the recount by 16 votes out of 88,000 votes cast. So that was a good time to call for a recount. It was a very good time. <laughs> and then in the year 2002, I ran again. And that time, there were only three people running. And fortunately, my uh, margin of victory was much wider. Uh, between me and my nearest opponent uh, was 135,000 votes. So it was good. Yeah. But you asked the question. And that tells you you're doing a good job, too, not to interrupt you. But that gives you a good feeling when you get elected when you've only been in term for such a short time. It must have told you you were doing something right. It told me I was doing a good job. It also told me that I now have six years to make a lot of changes in the right. system and improve it. But to your answer to your question, should it be elected, should it be appointed? If you look at the position of the register or probate and family court and see historically why it was uh, uh, put into the state constitution, by the way, it is the oldest constitutional office in the country. It was 1692. And the reason the register was elected by the people was so that the register could travel through each of the villages and hamlets throughout Middlesex County, making sure that the judges which were appointed by the English aristocracy, the English monarchs, were being fair in their distribution of judgments and, and, and decisions on cases. People did not trust the, the the, the judges. And so the register traveled with the judge. So now, kind of like a little watchdog exactly, to make it was sure about, everything was right. Right. And if you look at the judicial branch of government in the United States, and particularly in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, out of the 7,000 employees in the system, only 28 are elected. Hmm. 14 superior clerks of courts, and in our county we have Mr. Ed Sullivan, and 14 registers of probate were elected. So we, uh, 28, are answerable to the public that elect us. So you have a judicial branch with elected officials who answer to the public, not to the judges. So that's the good news and the bad news. That's the good news and the bad news. Right. Um, I think it should be elected because if you look at historically in Middlesex County from the year 2000, uh, from 1990 to 2000, we take a look. In the year 2000, when the register left to become a judge, there was a gentleman who was appointed. The public did not elect him. He, was n he did not retain his seat. Mm -hmm. So he was defeated. And then they elected another person. She served there for six years. The public did not reelect her because they did not feel as though they were comfortable in the support that she gave the position. Mm -hmm. And that was in two 1996. And in 1996, the person that was elected was removed by the courts for what the courts determined is inappropriate behavior. Mm. Now, the governor then appointed someone to finish that term. He ran for the job, and he was not elected. So you have in a 10-year period the public three times turning people out. Fortunate for me, I was elected in 2000 and re-elected. I was the first register re-elected since 1988, some and 18 years. fortunate for us, too. For you. <laughs> so I, and I think that the position of the register should really be one that is answerable to the public, that if the register does the job, they should be, he or she should be reelected. If they don't do the job, the public has spoken three times in 10 years, you're out of office. If they're appointed, and with the exception of the register and the superior court clerk, all the rest of the clerk magistrates are, are appointed. Hmm. I don't know of any that were removed. Well, they're that's, that's answerable, a good thing. They're not answerable to the public. They're answerable to the judiciary, which is run by the judges. So I think they have the independence mm -hmm. to be in a position to speak for the public and not worry about losing their job is a far better cry. And if you take a look, if you take a look at all the studies that have been done on the court system since 1974, what do they point to? They point to the lack of administrative accountability in the judicial system. Right. And what the studies have said is that you need to have people who are independent, who are administrators, who can run things, um, and not people who are going to be answerable to just some judges. Right. And accountability is a big issue for everyone in our yes. own personal lives as well as in our government. I think I would like to see more people individually accountable, not mm -hmm. just from a political standpoint, mm -hmm. but 
from where we all sit. Right. So that's a nice thing to right. have. Yeah. Let's get into a little bit of the meat of what you folks sure. do. And I thank you for that history lesson. That was really okay. informative. Uh, tell me how folks know when it's time to come and see you. Okay. When is it time to come to the probate office? Well, let, let's go through the list we've talked about. If you are going to adopt a child in Middlesex County, and by the way, Middlesex County takes in 54 cities and towns. Wilmington is one of them. It starts in Cambridge. It goes up to North Reading, to Lowell, all the way across to Ashby and uh, Pepperell, then all the way down to Marlboro, Hopkinton, Hop Hopkinton, Holliston, Hudson, back up to Natick, uh, Framingham, back over to uh, Newton, down to Watertown and Cambridge again. It's, it's uh, 1.5 million people. And in this county, if you're going to adopt a child, to make that adoption legal, you have to come to the probate court. Okay. Is that the first step? No, usually what happens is people will seek the help from an adoption agency. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes people wish to adopt relatives, so they would come to the court. And we would explain to them the procedures for legally adopting a child. If you are going to change your name, now, people who change their name through divorce now can simply check off a, 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 a box on a form that says, when I get divorced, I want to take back my maiden name. But if people wish to change their name, other than through that process, they have to come to the probate court. And when they come there, we will tell them what they have to do. And a change in name is not an automatic procedure. You actually have to petition the court, and you have to explain why. And uh, uh, there's background checks done, and a judge has to decide whether it's appropriate to change the name. But you have to come to the court. OK. If you're trying to establish the paternity ship of a child, you use the probate court to help you. You can have the court through a court order, insist upon the perceived father to take a DNA test. The court can order that. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to obtain child support for a payment of a child, and you are not getting the cooperation of the father, you can have the court help you establish the child support payment. The court can do a garnishing of wages, and through the Department of Revenue, they can be collected and passed on to the parent. Excellent. Let me stop you there for a moment. Yep. Let's give the phone number of where folks sure. can get more information. And if you would agree to it, I'd like to do a second segment where we get sure, into more of we it. Sure, Because there's so much to cover. So let's give a phone number where let's, folks let's start can with get the, a hold of you. The main number to the Probate and Family Court is 617-768-5800. And when you call that number, there is a menu. If you listen carefully, you can hear the menu as to where you may want to go. But my office, if you want to call my office to assist you, is 617-768-5959. Now, we also have a website. Please give that. And the website is a very useful site to go on uh, because it will help you to navigate the system to obtain directions to the courts, phone numbers, departments, uh, forms, forms that you can actually type on the computer and download. And that website is very easy to remember. It's www mcpfc.com. And to remember those initials, just think of Middlesex County Probate and Family Court. That's mcpfc.com. And that site is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can actually email to, uh, to me on that site as well. So you have the phone number and the website that you can access the probate court. And we'll put that up on the screen for folks. So you'll stay for a second segment. I will. We're going to talk more about the probate court when we come back with John Buolmo. Stay with us. We'll be back with more of Where's Wellington. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. It takes a man to be a dad. Hi, I am Zachary Duart of PAC 136, and you are watching WCTV Wilmington Community Television. Hi, welcome back to Where's Wilmington. I'm Lisa Kapala. Thank you for staying with us. We're doing something a little different on the show than we normally do. This is our second segment. Usually we have a local folk of interest on the show, but we're going to continue talking to John Bonomo because it's not often I get somebody in political office to come and chat with me. So <laughs> let's tell the folks what you do, what sure, the registrar sure. is, uh, register I should say. I should. And we were talking before the break about adoptions, but sure. we may want to shift our focus a little bit okay. to wills. Because sure. I know okay. when we hear the word probate, yeah. Yeah. most of the time that light goes off that says, oh, that's about the will. Okay. So What I do 
is as the register, I am the chief administrative officer who oversees the processing of the court. Um, a probate court is a court of records. Right. And so people quite often will come and they will ask to access records. So it's my job to be the custodian of those records. Mm, um, that's a big job. That makes me think of Katrina, New Orleans, record keeping, keeping it automated. Yes. You know? And so my job is to, to make sure that the records are maintained. My job is also to oversee the supervision of all the clerical staff. When you come to ask for records or to file records, those staff work for me. Your record is processed through the courts for people who work for me. And if you uh, have a judgment coming out of a courtroom, if you had to be scheduled for an initial appearance before a judge, it happens with our staff. And when records come out of the courtroom, it's my staff that process it. So it's really a very major clerical function um, that takes place in the courts. Um, so, And I think that's what we expect. Yeah. We expect somebody to keep the records and let us know what's going on right. so that we don't have to worry about that. You mentioned automation. I'm glad you right, did. Right. Um, we are now in the process of actually uh, scanning every court document that comes to us as effective January And how much 06. fun that's got to be. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Matter of fact, as of this morning, we had scanned some since January the 2nd, or 3rd, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We had uh, scanned almost 20,000 documents, wow. over 5,000 cases. And at some point soon, you'll be able to go online and get access to all public court probate records. And I want to emphasize wow. all public court, public court probate records, so that you won't have to come into Cambridge. But one of the things we've done is we've offered and introduced automation into the court. When I became the register in the year 2000, we had 17 computers. Five of them were still in the box that they had arrived in nine months before me. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to report that there is a computer on every desk. Excellent. And there are three terminals in the registry for public use for people to access oh, okay. documents and what they call docketing and indexing. Um, so we're moving to bring the court record process into the 21st century. And part of the reason for that is so that if something, a uh, disaster should occur, right. you'll have a backup, so well, to Well, the law requires me to have a backup. And if you take a look at the last three or four decades, you will see a certain amount of records kept on microfilm. You will see a certain amount of records kept on microfiche. Well, with automation and off-site storage, we now are able to scan the image of every document, and we're able to store it off-site so that if anything happened, God forbid, a flood, a fire, a disaster, we have preserved and protected all those records and in, in that they are maintained so that people can access them. Right. And better to do that before the disaster occurs. Than Obviously, after. we've learned that from right. Katrina and from New Orleans, mm -hmm. and sometimes a good thing can come out of a bad situation. Right. So in this case, maybe that is a right. good thing that we've learned yeah. from that. Now, tell me, will wills be yeah. able to be accessed on that site? Yes, they will. Most most wills, as a matter of fact, wills are public documents. Um, really? And they will be able I to access I consider that a private document. Well, no. Actually, if you take a look at the, uh, the whole intent of a will, a will is a document that is not made public until after someone has died. Correct. And what is very interesting about the public process is it allows people who have a right to inherit to know about that. Well, because the yeah, court needs to sense. notify the heirs that they have the right to uh, obtain or to, to receive what is rightfully theirs left in a will. Mm. So if someone weren't on the up and up, I could go on the site and make sure there's not a million with my name on it somewhere? Right. Okay. I'm um, going to do that when I get home. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing about wills, and people would say, do I need a will, do I need a trust? Right. I always tell people you need one of the two. If you have a will, um, you're clearly making your intentions known, uh, and you want it to be made public, and you want it, people to be notified, and the court to oversee that to make sure it's properly executed. If you have a trust, and many people have a trust, it's usually a blind trust. It's a trust that's kept by trustees with a schedule of benefits, and that is not kept in the probate court. Hmm. So somebody may be in a trust, and if the trustees don't take it upon themselves to hire someone to notify them or notify that person, it's possible you can in, be in a trust okay, and not know Okay, so it. then the obvious question would be, why would you choose a trust or a will? Or well, would someone very, help me decide yeah. that? Well, you know? what, the instrument that best fits you, but a trust allows you to keep it out of the public. It allows you to pass things on while you're alive. Oh, okay. People put things into like trust. Like a living will. Right, like a living will, but Massachusetts doesn't recognize a living will. Okay. Right? Um, a trust will allow you to establish trustees, to put things in trust, and there are two kinds of trust, Lisa. There is a revocable or reversible trust, and there is an irrevocable or re a non-reversible trust. Right. And if you put something in a non-reversible or a non-revocable trust, 
You can't get it back because the trust owns it. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you the benefit. I, I happen to have a will, not because I'm the registered probate. I have a will because there are a couple of things that a will benefits by that a trust cannot. If you have a will, you can have a homestead act, which you file right. with the Northern Registry of Deeds, which allows you to protect you in your home and allows you to protect you up to $500,000 of value for yourself and if you're married, a million dollars, which means that if someone tries to remove you from your home, you have protection. Right. If you have a trust, you cannot have a homestead act because a trust doesn't live in the house. So it sounds kind of like a trust is more a business option than a personal private option, right. but I guess it would depend right. on what your assets were. Right. Here's the other benefit of having a will. If you have a will, you can, be, you can sue the estate up to one year after the deceased. Hmm. After that, you cannot. As long as you have a trust and the trust, trust is an act of trust, you can sue the trust at any time. Okay. So the benefit is a will is a public document. People get to see what they have rightful ear to. A will is a document that you can have a homestead act, which is uh, important. Um, and a will has a limited time of which you can sue. Okay. A trust is a private document. It doesn't have the right to homestead. It's low, open to suit. But again, it's a, it's a matter of preference. If you okay. are comfortable with the will, you should have a will. But here's what's most important. Have one or the other. Right. Because people think that if they don't have a will and they don't have a trust, who inherits their estate? I think it's the state. Well, you know, that's a myth. Most people really? think it's the state. Good. We Let's don't. bust that myth right we now. We don't. Um, while I'd like to believe the state, because I'm the state, right. uh, that doesn't happen. If you really? have no will and you have no trust, there are clearly established guidelines in the court that says, depending upon what your marital status is and who in your family survives you, for example, if you are married and you have children, most people think that if the family gets it, the, the, the spouse gets it all. Not the case. Hmm. The spouse gets $200,000 of the first $200,000 in value. Okay. The remaining is divided 50-50. 50% to the spouse and 50% to the children. Which gets divided then subsequently between them. Right. So you're saying better to be safe than sorry. Right. Have a will or have a trust. Right. And, and, go from and if you have Right, correct. And if you, if you have no spouse and no children, then there's what they call in the legal terms level of sanguinity. Who next in line? Is right. it your parents? Is it your siblings? Is it your nephews? Is it your nieces? Is it your cousins? Is it your cousins, nephews, nieces? Is it your um, grandchildren? But all of that is determined by law. The state does not get anything. But make my job easier. Have a will. Have a trust. Yeah, and, and make if it you, easier on the surviving right. family, too. Yes. And by the way, there are a lot of people who have wills that they made out on their own. Here's what I would advise you. If you have a will that you made out on your own, take my advice. Go see a lawyer and have them review it. Because if I were to cut my own hair, it would be OK, but I'd have to go to a barber to fix it. Right. So if you have a will that you downloaded from an internet site, or if you have a will that you drew up on your own, please have an attorney review it to make sure that it's properly prepared so it doesn't get challenged or reduces mm. the likelihood of a challenge in court. Now, thinking about, about all this makes me think about health care proxy. Yes. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but sure. does that go with a will? Is it an adjunct to a will? Is it completely separate from a will? And when do you need to get one? Good. Well, uh, good, great question. Uh, I suggest that people have three documents. They have a will or a trust. They have a health care proxy, and they have a durable power of attorney. Mm. And the reason being is that if you should fall into a certain state of health where you're not able to make decisions for yourself, you can let your decisions be known with a health care proxy. And you can make clear what your intentions are, whether you wish to be resuscitated, not resuscitated. If you have a durable power of attorney, you're leaving somebody the power to make decisions within a certain scope. But those are documents that you should have. Uh, I tell the story that I recently went to the hospital for a minor scratch. I was working in my yard. When I got there, the first thing they asked me is, do you have a health care proxy? Hmm. And I said, I'm only here to take a look at a scratch. And they said, we don't want to be left with a medical and ethical dilemma if something happens wow. to you while you're here. So a health care proxy, a durable power attorney, and a will or a trust. So we start with a lawyer, and then we file these forms through your office. Right. You don't fi file a health care proxy or a durable power attorney with me okay. or a will. Okay. Those are all documents that you retain for your keeping, the, and so when time comes to execute them, you have them. I see. But however, let me respond to an interesting point. I do have thousands of wills of people that are alive. Do you have any idea why? 
They're public record, you said, but I don't know. Well, they are, but n not for those people that are alive. And you would ask yourself... Oh, but the people who are gone, right? right? Why would I have thousands of wills of people that are alive? I don't know. You have to well, tell me. Because <laughs> tell us all. We don't people even know. are afraid that their will may not make it to the probate oh, court. Okay. So we do what we call will for safekeeping, that people can deposit their wills with us for a fee. It is entered into an envelope. It is signed in this seal and is put into a vault. Oh, like and that. the only time that will becomes public is upon the proof of a death certificate or the individual whose will it is wishes to collect it. Yeah, that's very CSI Colombo to me. You know, yeah. it's good to know that it's locked in a vault, safe, where I can right. get at it for my right. family if I need it. Yeah. Let's give your website and phone number information okay. one more time. And can sure. you tell us a little bit about what we'll find okay, when we sure. call you or dial you up? If you call the main number, which is 617-768-5800, you will get a menu of departments that you can um, then uh, So go that would to. be like the adoption department, the probate department, the whatever department. Change of name, would be change of name, child support, et cetera. Okay, great. Uh, if you call 617-768-5959, you will get my office, directly to my office, and then we will assist you. And I always tell people, if you call my office, you hired me, I will, you hired me through electing me, I will call you back. Excellent. Um, and let's call the let's go to the website. Right. www.mcpfc.com. And what you will do is you'll get a homepage that will tell you about the website. It will give you links to the departments that I described. It will give you the phone numbers of people who run those departments. If you click on forms, you can get all of the forms that you would normally have to come to the court for. Mm. And it'll also tell you the fees. And very shortly, we will be putting instruction sheets for, to accompany each of those forms. Nice. You can also get directions to the court. You can get the judge's schedules on the court as wow. to what judges are where. Um, and you can get links to other legal uh, entities throughout the state. Uh, it is a website that I, I know, put up. I can't say that I would ever think a state website would be fun, but that sounds like it has a lot of interesting stuff on there, that things we should look into before it's too late. Right. I, I have some disappointing news for you. What's that? It's not a state website. It's not? No, the state hasn't put a website up yet, so I put it up. Oh, you did this on it's your own? own? It's my own site. Oh, well, that's and very good to know. I really felt that the public need to be able to come to the court, or if they that's don't good. need to come to the court, they can get that information. We do expect the state to go live with the so website. So we can show. use that as a model. Absolutely. They can certainly use what you've done to create their own website Absolutely. from there. But that's good to know about you. Yes. When are you up for re-election again? I'm not up for re-election until the year 2008. Uh, okay, it's a so six we have year some term. time. So we have a couple more years to go. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you I for really having me. I really appreciate your time. Will you come back again so we can discuss some more things? I'd be glad to. Excellent. Thank you for watching Where's Wilmington. I'm Lisa Gopala, and I'll see you again next time.